Hi everybody, welcome to McLean Hospital Grand Rounds. My name is Brent Forrester. I'm gonna be one of the two speakers and the person to introduce our two speakers. Um, I am the chief of the Division of Geriatric Psychiatry at McLean Hospital and uh, a senior medical director for value-based care solutions within population health management at Mass General Brigham. And I'm presenting today along with my colleague, Dr. Lexi Friedberg, who is a psychiatrist on our cognitive neuropsychiatry unit here at McLean Hospital, um, and also the medical director of behavioral health at Concerto Care, a company you're gonna hear more about during our talk. Um, so uh, today's talk is really trying to learn more for you all to learn more about new ways to take care of the rapidly growing aging population with mental health needs. So here are my disclosures, and here are Dr. Friedberg's disclosures. So we're gonna talk first, I'll talk briefly for the first few minutes about um, what is value-based care? How do we define value-based care? Why is it growing and why do we need to care about it in the world of psychiatry and mental health? Um, and then I'll talk about some of the evidence-based models that have really led to the utilization of the uh, collaborative care model in primary care settings. I'll turn it over to Dr. Friedberg to talk about her work uh, with Concerto Care. Uh, and here's some great clinical examples of how integrated care for older adults works. Then I'll talk about some of the work that we're doing here at Mass General Brigham within primary care to try to enhance the care of people with dementia in primary care settings. And hopefully we'll have some time for questions. So this slide really depicts what's going on in the world of uh, healthcare system transformation as it relates to the financing of healthcare. And if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, slide um, yesterday's healthcare uh, was real, and really it's often today's healthcare still is is really defined by care that's built around an institution like a McLean Hospital or a Mass General Hospital uh, or a Newton Wellesley Hospital where payments incentivize more care. So it's fee-for-service payments. The more we do, the more that's reimbursed. This has never worked out terribly well in psychiatry, but works out really well in the world of cardiology and orthopedic surgeon, surgery. And in this world of fee-for-service medicine of yesterday's healthcare, um, we're responsible for how people are doing immediately now, say post-operatively, in the very much an acute care model. Um, and we grudgingly accept this dramatic increase of healthcare costs. And essentially that ended in the United States with the uh, passage of the Affordable Care Act uh, during the Obama administration 12 years ago. And we're trying to move, slowly moving towards the direction of today's healthcare, which is a healthcare that's built around the patient and their family, I would argue, and you'll hear examples of that today, where payments are incentivizing not just more care, but better care, improved quality of care for both individual patients and for a population, where we're responsibility for a population and their ongoing health, not just their immediate health care needs, and we just cannot sustain the rapidly, rapid escalation in health care costs. Um, and this slide depicts sort of a, an equation, if you will, that defines value as outcomes over cost. So the higher the cost of a procedure or an intervention with poor outcomes, the worse value. Um, Outcomes can be defined in many ways. We can look at morbidity and mortality. We can look at the quality of care with various quality metrics, which by the way, in psychiatry and behavioral health, we don't have many of them and they're not well, um, often well implemented, certainly not implemented widely within psychiatry yet. Um, we try to reduce healthcare disparities. That's an increasingly important outcome that's actually being financially incentivized by the state of Massachusetts um, and improve the experience of care for the patient. And there are many of other outcomes that we can look at. And these are all outcomes that I imagine we all would agree are, are good outcomes to try to achieve. And population health is really just an infrastructure or a structure to try to achieve better outcomes for our patients and the population while minimizing the escalation in costs. And there are various tools that we utilize, including registries um, and dashboards and quality metrics and care management, which we'll talk a lot about today. And then we'll also talk about um, uh, specifically some of the models in behavioral health like collaborative care. Um, those of us who work in the mental health um, field know this, but um, this slide, which is now is over a decade old, but came out of this Milliman report um, almost a decade ago, uh, really looked at when you add a behavioral health condition to a patient who has any general medical condition, the cost of care skyrocket. And this is true whether you're covered by Medicaid, Medicare, or a commercial insurer. And if you look at just the bottom row, all, insur uh, bottom row, all insurers all put together, 
the percent of people with a behavioral health diagnosis, the PMPM refers to the per patient, per, per member per month, so how much you're paying per member per month. Without a diagnosis, $397. With a diagnosis of a behavioral health condition, it, it goes up almost threefold. This is true across the board with psychiatric conditions, including dementia. So collaborative care refers to a very specific model that was developed by Dr. Jurgen Unitzer at the University of Washington and colleagues. The first study was done really two decades ago. And most people don't realize this, but the collaborative care model was actually developed for geriatric mental health patients with depression. Even though it's now been applied across the country and is now being incentivized and reimbursed um, in, for adult populations with depression, uh, and now they're looking for collaborative care for bipolar disorder and other psychiatric conditions, it was first studied for late life depression with some of our colleagues uh, over the years. But essentially what it is, it's a model of care that uses a team-based approach in primary care where the mental health embedded team is collaborating with the primary care clinicians. Um, at MGB, we have rolled out collaborative care for depression and anxiety within our clinics since 2014. And today, in 2022, about 85% of all of our primary care clinicians across the network have an access to this team. This team has increasingly become a virtual team since the pandemic began, and the um, effectiveness uh, persists. In some ways, it's getting better because we're getting better at measuring what we need to measure. But this includes a behavioral health coach or a behavioral health support specialist, often a non-clinician, a psychiatrist supervisor. Oftentimes, there'll be a social worker involved as well to help with care coordination and resource referrals. But a couple of the basic principles of collaborative care is measurement-based care. We don't put somebody on an insulin with diabetes without measuring their blood sugar or give them an antihypertensive without measuring their blood pressure. And yet, all the time in psychiatry, we're putting people on medications and doing psychotherapy without measuring the severity of their symptoms routinely. Primary care, in some ways, is better than we are in the field of psychiatry in doing measurement-based care. And this is a great example of measurement-based care, trying to get, achieve remission, not just an improvement of symptoms, but a return to functioning. And I'm bringing this model up because this model informs the basis of some of the work we're now doing in geriatric mental health care beyond depression with more complex illness, as you're about to hear about from Dr. Friedberg, as well as with patients who have dementia and associated psychiatric complications. The outcomes of these studies, and by the way, there have been more than 85 replications of the original model in various places, but the response rate in terms of depression, depression symptom improvement over 12 months was more than twofold higher with the intervention, which was called IMPACT, the original collaborative care intervention. The costs of care four years later or less and cardiovascular and other medical outcomes are actually better as long as eight years after a one-year intervention, including an improvement in functioning, a redu reduction in pain, very importantly, a reduction in suicidal ideation, and an improved access to preferred treatment. So we've adopted this model widely in our system, and now the state of Massachusetts is going to be incentivizing practices to do even more of it by actually allowing for billing of this service separate from the usual psychotherapy codes that we use and psychopharm codes. Now switching to the geriatric population, I just want to highlight a couple of uh, key points before I turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Friedberg. Uh, we all know that, well, we're all getting older, it's no, it's no surprise. And the main reason why in the United States we're all getting older is the baby boomers. The first baby boomer turned 65 in 2011. Um, so over the next 30 years, we're going to see a rise in the number of people in the United States, today at 46 million, to nearly double that at 90 million. And the number one risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease is how long we live. And that's why we're seeing a dramatic increase in the population of people with dementia, 6.5 million-ish now in uh, 2022, going up to nearly 13 million Americans, um, more than double over the next 30 years. Um, because of this, we're seeing so much more need for our services, and yet, we're doing a terrible job training new mental health providers in geriatric psychiatry. Not just psychiatrists, but geriatric medicine physicians, social workers, nurses, et cetera. We need to grow a massive workforce. And we can't just expect the usual traditional models of fee-for-service care, one-on-one -on -one care to work. It has to be moving in this new direction. Right now in the United States, we're training, believe it or not, 50 new geriatric psychiatrists a year. That's it. We have about 50 or so programs. Some states are training none. Some states have one or two geriatric psychiatrists. We have five times that number in our division alone here at McLean. 
We're also seeing this epidemic of Alzheimer's, which we're going to focus more on later on. And you can see some of the facts and figures, which not only include the prevalence numbers, but the impact on costs, which is about $321 billion a year, which does not take into account the costs lost to time to work uh, for caregivers. And then finally, and very importantly, the racial and ethnic disparities in just the dementia population are staggering. Um, we know that African Americans have nearly double the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease than Caucasians. Hispanics, about one and a half times the risk and yet they're more reluctant to seek care. Caucasians are more likely to go see the doctor if they're having a memory complaint. And one in five black and Latino Americans have said that they'd feel insulted if a doctor suggested a cognitive assessment. So there's so many barriers to overcome when it comes to equity in the delivery of gold standard dementia care. So I'm gonna now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Friedberg, to talk about her experiences working with concerto care. Hi, everyone. So um, today I'm going to talk about geriatric mental health care in a value-based care startup. And I will first talk about the evolution of my involvement with a primarily full risk-bearing geriatric health care entity. And this was a, a company that's grown from six people to uh, now, I think, two or 300 and uh, is a national entity over the past four years. I will share a case example. And then finally, some lessons that I've learned. So in 2018, I was approached by the leadership of Perfect Health. This was a small, new geriatrics house calls practice just north of Boston. And the practice was founded by a geriatrician and a population health executive. And they were looking for a very part-time geriatric psychiatrist to join their team. So I was very excited about any healthcare organization that had behavioral health at the forefront in the beginning and that this wasn't just an afterthought for this group. So was, I agreed to join. I, um, over the next few slides, I'll describe the practice and then how we focused and how we grew over the next few years and then the essential role that behavioral health played in these very early days. So our initial patient population was about 300 patients. We were taking care of all older adults. They all met formal Medicare criteria for homebound status. About half of them lived in their homes, and the other half lived in one of about 10 area assisted living facilities, or ALFs. The payer mix for these patients was about 75% traditional fee-for-service Medicare. And there was a supplemental program as well called chronic care management. And the other 25% had a specific commercial Medicare Advantage plan. And now for those of you who, who don't know, a Medicare Advantage plan is sometimes called Medicare Part C. It's an alternative to traditional fee-for-service Medicare, and it's a Medicare-approved plan from a private insurer. So for example, Tufts Medicare Preferred or Blue Cross Blue Shield Medics are some, some plans that you may have heard of. And these plans are similar to HMOs, and they involve capitated bundled payments for all of a patient's care. The amount of that proactive payment can be adjusted based on the patient's burden of underlying illness or the historical cost of their care. For this <clears throat> latter group of Perfect Health patients, our practice had a contract with the insurer whereby Perfect Health assumed total financial risk for all healthcare expen expenses, meaning office visits, visiting nurses, um, and then also ED visits and hospitalizations and short-term re rehab stays. So the way this works is that if a patient's health is managed better than expected, then part of that cost savings can sometimes be kept by the provider group. And if a patient's health is poorer than expected, and there are, for example, many ED visits or surgeries or hospitalizations, that may amount to a financial loss for the organization. So the initial care team was made up of a geriatrician, two nurse practitioners, a nurse case manager, two medical assistants, and then eventually myself. And the thinking was that as the part-time geriatric psychiatrist, I would do a combination of things. I would provide e-consultations, I would do telephonic curbsides, I would attend interdisciplinary huddles, and then I would make house calls to patients in their homes and in their assisted livings. So I went in with limited experience in primary care settings to begin with, and I was immediately blown away by the amount of unmet psychiatric need in this population. Here we were just outside of Boston, and our patients were, our providers were doing fabulous job managing first and second line therapies for depression and anxiety. That's when the diagnosis was correct, but then they were, they're sort of guessing at the rest. 
And so you have to keep in mind, these were patients who, because of their cognitive or functional or logistical or insurance limitations, could not easily get outside their home to go see a specialty mental health clinician. And if they were able to go out and see someone in the community, that person was not usually, did not always have geriatric expertise or they were siloed. And so there wasn't an incentive or there wasn't an infrastructure for them to meaningfully integrate their care into the care that we were doing on the primary care side. So when I first started, I naively assumed that the best, the best use of a resource as scarce as myself was to build a collaborative care model for a homebound population. So. I read everything I could about collaborative care and the impact study, and then, I, I'm not kidding, I watched a recording of a Grand Rounds given by Dr. Brent Forrester, and I watched it over and over and over again. Uh, this was before I was working at McLean, actually. So I went to our leadership at Perfect Health, and I said, far more than a psychiatrist, we need a social worker. And my vision was that the social worker would, would, would really serve a couple of roles, would do some case management, but would also be a behavioral health support specialist along the lines of what happens in a collaborative care team. So we were very lucky. We recruited somebody exceptional into that role. But then here's what happened. So in the first three months before the social worker even started, we had four patients psychiatrically hospitalized from assisted living facilities. And most of these, but not all, were for dementia-related agitation. Some others were for depressive disorders or serious mental illness. And these were not one or three or even seven-day hospitalizations. These were weeks and weeks long, oftentimes. Some of these were here at McLean Hospital. In fact, the leadership of Perfect Health saw that the patients with the highest total medical expense, or TME, were these four patients. We just we realized that as a practice, we were not hearing about patients' needs escalating until it was too late. There was a crisis, someone had called 911. We just didn't have any time to put in place a safe diversionary plan. So our leadership suggested an audacious goal. Could we build a geropsychiatry inpatient unit without walls? Or at a minimum, could we build a geropsychiatry urgent care? What would it take for us to identify those patients who are at rising risk due to their behavioral health issues, and then to intervene proactively well in advance of a crisis? What would it look, to, look like to flex up when crises did occur? And just what would that care look like if we had the flexibility to provide the right care at the right time in the right place without the stringent fee-for-service billing and coding requirements? So we started by doing a chart audit of the entire practice. And we found that 75% of our patients already had a diagnosis of a mental disorder when they entered our practice, if you included cognitive disorders. And this was before we even started routinely screening for depression and anxiety and cognitive disorders. And only a minority of our patients had mild to moderate depression or anxiety. More of our patients had serious mental illness or they had dementia with related behavioral disturbance. The factors that we determined contributed most, contributed most to the psychiatric crises included living in the assisted living itself. Um, there was, across the board, inadequate diagnosis and risk assessment and treatment. We identified gaps in coordination among the assisted living teams and pharmacies and families and visiting nurses agencies. We found gaps in assisted living staff training and then the integration of their work with our primary care team. And then probably most importantly, there was a culture among the assisted livings that we worked with of just sending people to emergency rooms, sometimes reactively, and there was really no other way. Um, these were trips that were often destabilizing to patients and distressing to families. The hospitalizations were often prolonged. They might lead to delirium or hospital-acquired infections or deconditioning, and many patients never returned to the assisted livings but instead transitioned to nursing homes. So uh, during an early conversation I had with one of our partner assisted livings with uh, one of the executive directors, I'll never forget, she said, you know, I wish that all patients before they moved into our community could have a Jerry psych hospitalization. That way we would know that when they arrived, they were on the right medications. And I thought, there has to be a better way. <laughs> so we pivoted away from building a perfect collaborative care program in the community to focus more on where we saw the area of the greatest need, which was in the assisted living uh, setting. So what did this program look like? We chose anywhere between the six to 12 assisted living facilities where we had the greatest patient density. 
we implemented universal thresholds to refer to our social worker, who would then conduct a really thorough psychiatric intake. So this would include a medication history, a, f a thorough psychiatric review of systems, and then conduct sometimes uh, structured screening instruments and use some rating scales. And then she would begin treatment planning and brief interventions. This was done in close collaboration with the PCP and then myself, and for more of a diagnostic workup and initial management. Our social workers became very skilled at ger geriatric differential diagnosis, and my involvement may have included just a single patient visit. This work relies heavily on wraparound care teams, and so inter interdisciplinary huddles are a cornerstone of our success. We huddle a lot, and these take two primary forms with the assisted livings we work in. So first, the social worker and I instituted monthly assisted living behavioral health huddles, which were really these bi-directional updates between our concerto care team, our perfect health team, and the assisted living staff about any behavioral health issues that were arising in our mutual patients. And then separately, on a weekly basis, we had and we continue to have our high-risk primary care huddles, and these are attended by the entire primary care team, but also social work and sometimes psychiatry. We also, inter we also offered 24-7 psychiatric support. And then in rare cases, we would contract with private one-to-one -one caregivers. For example, if there was a week where a patient was having a particularly difficult time and there was increased dysregulation and maybe we needed to conduct a medical workup at home, so we were going out, getting vital signs, getting labs in the community, sending out mobile x-rays, mobile EKGs, and we needed just more eyes and ears there while we were maybe adjusting medications a little bit more rapidly. So together, all of these elements that I describe, they shaped an entirely new culture of behavioral health friendliness amongst these facilities. And with this multi-pronged approach, we then saw the total elimination of psychiatric hospitalizations for over 20 months in this population of 40 assisted living residing patients. So this graphic illustrates a little bit about how this assisted living program is a blend of existing models and practices, and on the left, you see that um, this is sort of a traditional, traditionally how most assisted living care uh, is structured. So in the center, you see the patient and oftentimes a healthcare proxy, which, which may be activated for some patients. A primary care practice, practitioner may be on site and embedded or may be off site. Same thing with, with psychiatry. There are some private practice psychiatrists or professionals who will go and make visits to assisted living facilities, but other times patients and their families will, will go off site. And then, like I mentioned, ERs and hospitals uh, do form a, a big part of stabilization for these patients. On the right is the collaborative care model, which is traditionally delivered in a primary care clinic setting, in which Brent spoke about earlier. So our integrated model co connects more of the dots than the traditional assisted living care does, and then it adds the support of the entire, excuse me, the entire primary care team, and it adds the components of a behavioral health support specialist, who in our model is a social worker, and then a patient registry. So over the next few years, Perfect Health grew to other geographies in Massachusetts, eventually totaling about 2,000 homebound patients, and then in 2020, it joined with another company to form a national entity, which is now called Concerto Care, and is in eight states. <clears throat> so with this corporate merger also came greater support for behavioral health program building and implementation. We started by conducting a behavioral health needs assessment of our entire organization from all clinical levels, operations teams, and executive leadership. We wanted to understand what was our organization's baseline knowledge about integrated care, and more importantly, what were our attitudes? And we needed to understand what level of buy-in were we going to need as we launched these new programs and entirely new ways of caring for patients across the country. So, we also wanted to understand how comfortable were our PCPs at assuming primary oversight of behavioral health needs. And we found that they averaged around 50 on a scale of zero to 100, but the responses were so variable. We identified immediately a number of areas where we needed to gather better data on an ongoing basis, both on a population level, but then also at the level of individual clinicians through the use of patient registries. So fast forward about two years, and the Concerto Care Behavioral Health Program looks very different from the perfect health programs in Massachusetts. 
I wouldn't say that it's in its infancy, but definitely in its adolescence. So today we are in eight states, and our hubs are in urban and suburban and rural settings. We still do not have brick and mortar clinic settings with very few exceptions, but instead we bring all care to patients in their homes. Our patient population is now in the tens of thousands, and most are frail and or medically complicated older adults. The payer sources for our patients are what are known as full risk contracts primarily, with health insurers mostly Medicare Advantage, as I described before, or an innovative direct contracting program with, um, with Medicare itself. So our team now has nine social workers, 15 community health workers, one psychiatrist medical director, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and a vice president for behavioral health. Our leadership in our division has a more general expertise, but locally we can specialize more. So for example, if there is a hub where there's a much higher burden of substance use disorders, we may specifically seek out a community health worker who has experience in that realm. Or if there's an area where there's a higher uh, prevalence of dementia, we may look for a community health worker with lived dementia caregiver experience. And we, of course, have dedicated field team members on the ground in people's homes and their communities. But we've substantially shifted our work to virtual wherever possible, sometimes relying on assisted telehealth with one of our team members in person and the other one virtual. And I can't say that we have really perfected this balance yet, and I don't think that anyone in healthcare has. Operationally, we're much more sophisticated. We have processes and, and protocols, and we've standardized much of our training. And our key performance indicators, or KPIs, are some standard utilization metrics, like admissions per thousand, ED visits per thousand, and readmissions per thousand. But more importantly, we've homegrown a general behavioral health quality metric, and we're trying to use measurement-based care specific to each clinical subpopulation. So what do we actually do, and how do we do it? We offer our patients brief evidence-based treatments with our social workers and community health workers. We have psychi psychiatry open office hours for all clinicians. We have systematic case reviews regularly with social work and psychiatry. And we still have many primary care high-risk huddles, which are attended by social work, community health workers, and psychiatry. What we do not offer at this point are psychiatry house calls or psychiatry virtual visits. So what does this look like in practice? I'm going to share a case where usual care and traditional fee-for-service would not likely have resulted in the same outcomes. And this case has been substantially de-identified, such that the patient would not recognize herself in the vignette. So Betty is a 75-year-old woman with chronic kidney disease and diabetes. In 2019, she was psychiatrically hospitalized for about a month for an inability to care for herself, for social withdrawal, for paranoid delusions that her neighbors were monitoring her through her apartment walls and were plotting to steal all of her belongings. And due to this fear, she stopped leaving her apartment to see her family or her friends or her medical providers. In the hospital, she was given provisional diagnoses of major depression with psychosis, vascular mild cognitive impairment, and a hoarding disorder. She was stabilized on an antidepressant and an atypical antipsychotic and discharged home. She did see a psychiatric nurse practitioner one time in the community, but did not follow through after that. So gradually, over the next six months, she stopped taking all medications, statin, lisinopril, metformin, psychotropics, all of them. And her delusions did return in full force, but this time without affective symptoms. She still allowed home visits, though, from our geriatrician, and then eventually many visits from our social worker. So from the sidelines, my role was to coach the team, so the geriatrician, the nurse, the social worker, around how to build and strengthen alliance with someone who has paranoia, and then around how to retitrate medications, how to consider decisional capacity issues, and then over a period of several months, her delusions resolved, she re-engaged with her community, and her hemoglobin A1C decreased from 12 to 9, and her blood pressure normalized. Betty is such a great example of how of Brent's earlier data that addresses that how behavioral health, when that's improved, it dramatically improves overall health status. No surprise to anybody here. Unfortunately, in the fa past few months, she went backwards again a little bit. She's become more distrustful, more dysphoric, and has acknowledged that she takes her medications sometimes. But our field teams have found pretty disorganized pill cassettes and a lot of scattered tablets all around the furniture in the kitchen. 
So she did agree, surprisingly, to try a long-acting version of the antipsychotic she was taking, but the co-payment was cost prohibitive. So to have her facility staff oversee her medications would have added $750 a month, which was not something she could afford, and insurance clearly doesn't cover. Her primary care physicians tried um, a, a cross taper to oral haloperidol, but it was never really clear that she was taking it. And then there was a crisis a few weeks ago when, she, when her blood sugars and her blood pressure were dangerously high, and our team had no choice but to send her to the emergency room. She was then admitted on an observation status, <clears throat> and with her blood sugar and her blood pressure normalized, she was not felt to meet Section 12 criteria. She wanted to go home, and so she went home. What happened next was extraordinary. Her primary care nurse practitioner visited her daily over the next two weeks, including weekends, to check her vital signs and to oversee and help her take her medications. And we saw that Betty's paranoia resolved, and just last week she reported she's feeling like her old self again. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and share six lessons learned over four years of doing this work. <clears throat> Lesson one, desirable outcomes and therefore value are often but not always aligned across patient, patients, providers, and payers. It is exhilarating and it is liberating as a clinician to work outside the confines of fee-for-service reimbursement. But as a physician leader, hearing the words adverse utilization enough times can really lead you down a slippery slope away from quality and towards cost cutting. We can absolutely devise individual level and population level interventions that reduce high cost utilization, but to state what's obvious to clinicians, keeping people out of the hospital doesn't always mean they're feeling well or functioning well. I have a few crude warnings that I share with the finance team, and one of them is we can't keep people out of the hospital only to have them die of catatonia at home. So when you're measuring success with metrics like utilization, you really can lose sight of the fundamental question, which is how are patients doing? One thing that I find interesting is that perhaps more than any other medical discipline, mental health clinicians are already trained to consider what is the least restrictive setting for this patient. This is part of our routine clinical decision making. And this often aligns with fiscal efforts to reduce hospitalization but importantly, to do this safely, it requires multidisciplinary community supports and adequate safe hospital diversionary strategies. And these are lacking for the general population, but especially so for older adults. <clears throat> Lesson two, moving beyond the PHQ-9. Meaningful quality measurement is difficult for complex older patients. <clears throat> Most clinicians know we should be using some measurement-based care, and in theory, we, we really want to. But across all age groups, we don't have great clinical metrics that are transdiagnostic, easy to administer, patient-centered, clinically meaningful, and then tied to both symptomatic and functional outcomes. And when it comes to older adults, attempts to separate <clears throat> psychiatric outcomes from medical outcomes make little sense clinically or fiscally in a risk-bearing organization. Another crude message I've given to our finance team if my psychiatric treatment decreases psychiatric hospitalizations, but instead causes strokes or falls with injury or aspiration pneumonia, then we're failing as an organization. And as an aside, the behavioral health balance sheet looks better, but total medical expense is higher. So to address this patient level outcome measurement at Concerto Care, we've devised a three item assessment tr tool that we call the BFAS, which stands for behavioral health function and symptom tracker. This tool is meant to be used serially with all of our patients who are, are, are referred internally to behavioral health. This seeks to capture patients' core symptoms and their functional imp impairments, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And while obviously this isn't a validated instrument yet, so far it's easy for cl clinicians to administer, patients aren't complaining about it, and it has, proven, <clears throat> it has provided a lot of preliminary data that show our work is helping people feel and function better. Excuse me. Lesson three. Geriatric mental health clinicians' greatest value is to our peers and through our peers. We geriatric mental health clinicians are scarce. I joke that I was never a popular kid in high school, but this day and age when I enter 
uh, a new social setting and I disclose my profession, suddenly I become very cool. So scaling these specific skills and this body of knowledge over a larger population means that I personally do less patient-facing work and more capacity building. I'm on a mission to demystify and destigmatize older adult mental health for as many clinicians as possible. So this involves empowering non-psychiatric clinicians to be our eyes and our ears and our interventionists through mostly a combination of case-based learning and didactics. This also involves providing what I call enhanced consultation. So I may only have a single opportunity to weigh in on a patient's care. And so from the get-go, I'm going to be mapping out titration schedules and contingency plans and deprescribing opportunities. Our concerto care PCPs generally report a high level of satisfaction with having embedded behavioral health, 7.7 um, .7 out of 10. <clears throat> and much of that stems actually not from the support we offer with psychiatric assessment and di diagnosis, <clears throat> but instead things like managing boundaries, compassion fatigue, patient behavior change, and what we like to call counterproductive engagement. This is where our value, excuse me, addresses what is thought of as the fourth prong of the quadruple aim, improved provider experience and team well-being. The fact that I don't have to see and bill for every single patient encounter, this frees me up to, be, to provide more flexible support for uh, PCPs who otherwise really struggle to get timely responses from external behavioral health clinicians. It's been extremely gratifying to see our primary care teams become so much more self-sufficient with geriatric psychiatry bread and butter. They know how to distinguish depression from demoralization, how to distinguish apathy from depression, or how to thoughtfully approach medication choices for behavioral symptoms of dementia. They're more skilled, they're more comfortable. So I was floored recently when one of our geriatricians asked me, what, would, what should we do next for our patient with Lewy body dementia and psychosis? And I said, you're probably not going to like this answer, but probably clozapine. And she said, no problem. Just I'll register with the REMS. You can just talk me through the titration. Or another patient who recent, recently moved here from out of state, uh, the PCP is prescribing two long-acting injectable antipsychotics for now for a woman uh, with schizophrenia who due to her negative symptoms, hasn't yet been able to leave her apartment to go see a new psychiatrist. Lesson four. As geriatric mental health professionals, <clears throat> working clinically outside fee-for-service systems through general practitioners both increases access and reduces stigma. Most older adults don't want a psychiatrist. They want their primary care team to handle everything for continuity and for convenience. There are exceptions, though, and we try to use the patient's or the family's attitudes towards psychiatry and how we communicate. So for example, some primary care recommendations are more acceptable to patients when they have the expert backing. So that might sound like I consulted with our psychiatrist, Dr. So-and-so, and this was the recommendation. Lesson five, messaging to patients and families around a non-traditional clinical frame is difficult but essential. We work, we work hard to individualize how our PCPs introduce our social, work, social workers and our behind-the-scenes psychiatrist in the most palatable way to patients and families. Patients often have strong feelings about words like social worker, therapist, counselor, coach. And so we take extra time to de-emphasize those titles and focus instead on where, for example, Marisa, our grief expert, or Christine, our depression problem solver, could lend an, an extra hand. Or we're explicit, like this won't be working with your old psychiatrist whom you saw every single month no matter what. We will adjust who checks in with you and how and when based on how you're doing. And the sixth and final lesson, it can feel uncomfortable to provide care with less data <clears throat> and fewer touch points. So I worry that routine involuntary movement screening or metabolic monitoring isn't always happening or that I'm missing, missing too much data by not seeing patients directly. <clears throat> there is a limbic sense that one gets by meeting with somebody directly that can never be replaced by this model. There have been a few times when, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over something that is not COVID. There, um, there have been a few times when I have heard extensively about a patient only to meet them later and be struck by a data point or a dynamic that I never could have appreciated secondhand. 
Recently, a concerto care patient was hospitalized here in my unit at McLean Hospital. This was a woman whom I'd previously never met, but I'd been working on a weekly basis with her, psych with her PCP and her social worker. And I felt like I knew her really, really well. And then I met her. The fact that she was curled up in a fetal position most of the time, but wore a crisp button-down shirt and pearl earrings, or the fact that she didn't really make eye contact unless she was talking about her husband, or the fact that she had psychomotor slowing but didn't actually have Parkinsonian symptoms. These were all data points and dynamics that I, I just couldn't have appreciated until I met her. So do I worry sometimes that we're trading quality for access? Absolutely. But to anyone who thinks it's hard to find geriatric mental health services in Massachusetts, just try doing it in rural Ohio. And so at those moments that this clinical touch feels a little bit too light for my comfort, then I just have to remind myself of the alternatives, which is no behavioral health care, or fragmented care, or care that lacks geriatric sensitivity. <clears throat> because outside the clinic, or the long-term care, or the nursing home setting, the behavioral health access for homebound elders is non-existent. And so even a consultative model is arguably, arguably better than usual care for patients, and it is definitively better for providers who are just trying to do their best. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Brent. Lexi, that was terrific. And I hope everyone appreciates how innovative this model of care is that Concerto Care is doing, and also appreciates that it's a for-profit company. It's very different than working in a traditional academic healthcare system. So what I want to do is, is contrast that. I think you'll see similar themes in the work that we're doing at Mass General Brigham, but we're doing it in a tertiary academic healthcare system. And we're trying to use the same principles of integrated care and value-based care. And I'm going to use the example of Alzheimer's disease, which essentially is the epidemic of our time. It's going to grow in prevalence and cost, as I just talked about. And for all the reasons Lexi mentioned, behavioral health specialists, geriatric mental health providers, including psychiatrists, are really at the epicenter of this pandemic because we do have the tools to be able to lead teams to really care for the whole person with dementia and to support their families. And if we do it the right way, we will indeed reduce the overall costs. So I've been very fortunate to have a, a role within Mass General Brigham for the past seven years, uh, leading behavioral health efforts within population health. And um, through that role, I was able to start and develop two initiatives that I'm going to briefly describe now. Both of these initiatives are focused on the dementia population, one funded by the healthcare system through population health management, that's the memory care initiative. We launched that as the pandemic was breaking out. And the Crescent program we launched in the fall of 2020, and that was an NIA-funded federal grant. I'll tell you both about those. So the first thing that we did was we, and there's a lot of details on the slide, but the point I want to make, and, and Lexi was talking a lot about this, is that we need to engage our stakeholders. We're not going to come up with some model in our head based on what we're thinking about in a room and give it to a primary care team and expect them to implement it. We've got to work with them to find out where their pain points are. It seems kind of obvious, but unfortunately a lot of the, the first example happens. So we did a needs assessment in primary care clinicians at Mass General Brigham across our system back in 2018. We found that there was profound need and interest in learning about dementia diagnosis. There was limited knowledge about access to resources and access to specialists, which we knew about. They didn't have enough time. Um, there are so many complexities when working with families around family dynamics and social complexities, and certainly not enough staff support within a primary care practice, as well as a lack of disease under understanding. Now, all of those problems that were identified in primary care led to opportunities on the right for education and training, for support, for improving diagnosis, for medication deprescribing, for re referral to resources and specialty care, and with an opportunity as we tried to calculate that we would, we would be saving a lot of money because of the increased um, cost per month of over $600 when someone has a cognitive disorder than when they don't. So after meeting for about a year, we decided to move forward with a model that was based on a UCLA-developed model called the Alzheimer's Dementia Care Model, or ADC model. My colleague um, David Rubin developed this with, with others. We became the first site, or one of the first sites, for his demonstration project um, where we launched this model again in the winter of 2020. It has at its center the patient and the family, but the core team members 
are a geriatric nurse practitioner, a social worker, supervising geriatrician. Geriatric psychiatrist was not part of the original model, and I'm not going to dwell on it now, but there's some political issues involved, too, when you're working in an academic healthcare system. And so it just sounded like something for me to sort of give in on and yet still be part of the team by being that consultant, similar to as Lexi is, when we meet on a weekly basis. We could not do this everywhere. This is an expensive model. These are actually highly qualified, trained folks. Um, but we decided to do it in five practices, two at the Brigham, one at the General, and two at Newton Wellesley. Um, you have to have a diagnosis of dementia, or your clinician has to suspect that you have some a suspicion of cognitive impairment to get in. And most of the patients were part of our Medicare ACO, the Accountable Care Organization. And we had lots of services that we offered to them, including diagnosis, medication deprescribing, care planning, connecting to resources, and so forth. Um, this is a very busy slide, but my point is we collect data. Remember I talked about measurement-based care? If you could read this slide, what you would see is that we're collecting a lot of data on the instruments that we think demonstrate quality care. So we're measuring the neuropsychiatric inventory of behavioral symptoms. We're measuring the caregiver strain index of caregiver burden. We're measuring depression symptoms in caregivers. We're measuring how many people actually have advanced health care done, so uh, advanced health directives. They've had serious illness conversations and so forth. We also risk stratify our patients. Red, you can see red, yellow, and green there. And the interventions that we give are based on how much risk they are of going to the ED or being hospitalized. So we can tailor the interventions accordingly. And the teams meet weekly for case review. We can also slice it based on insurer, based on age, based on location, and so forth. When we did, our former fellow, Dr. Aaron Greenstein, did a wonderful um, interview of uh, our key stakeholders, some of our primary care clinicians and our staff, um, to really try to understand qualitatively how has this been valuable. I lost the picture, Steve. <laughs> I can tell you, by looking over here, um, the intervention is valuable in many different ways, but it's non-burdensome. We're basically addressing these PCP self-identified needs for further education and training. Um, it decreases PCP burnout. It supports the care of complex patients. You want to come up? You can. Um, and it also helps us with um, early identification problems and, and caregiver support. Um, there are many facilitators as well. It's really important to have a PCP champion in each of the practices. Somebody who's a leader of the practice, who believes in this model and can get other people in involved. They love the idea of co-management on site um, and they love the facilitated referral to specialty care like our memory clinic here at McLean, for example, or the clinics at MGH or the Brigham. But one of the barriers is that we don't really have a financially sustainable model with this memory care initiative. We're not, like Lexi just described about these risk contracts they're involved in, we're involved in risk contracts, but we're not taking full on risk. We've yet to really enter into Medicare Advantage in a big way in our system. We're about to, as of January, launch into it, but it's an, it will be a new thing for us. Um, so the billing for these encounters, A, there's no incentive, and B, there's limited opportunity for fee-for-service generation through E&M codes when you see a nurse practitioner, or through this one dementia care manager code that you can bill twice a year, the 99483 code. And so people are worried, is this going to be a permanent program, is it going to stick around? So with all of that question and the cost of the model, we thought it would be important to test out some other models. So I started working, I've been working now for three years with my colleague, Dr. Christine Ritchie at MGH, who's an amazing person, geriatrician, palliative care doctor. And when she was at UCSF, she was helping develop this, this other model called Care Ecosystem. And when they developed that original model for dementia patients in primary care, it was really geared towards the, 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 in, the people doing the intervention were community health workers, non-clinicians. Instead of building a new structure of community health workers within the practice to do dementia care, thought it might be a better idea to take existing nurses who are providing wraparound care management services for our highest cost, highest need patients and train them in gold standard protocols, which the care ecosystem model is. So our goal was to really, in this pilot funded by the National Institute of Aging, was to assess the feasibility of implementing this model and then measure the outcomes of this adapted model for nurses in our system. Um, so we recruited 30 nurses who were part of the nurse care management program. They were the people that we studied is how they were trained, how they implemented the training, and, and the feedback they gave to us about the training. Um, we spent 
a fair amount of time collecting information from nurse leaders at MGB who had been part of the integrated care management program and really understood the lives of these nurses and what nurses needed to know in terms of dementia training. So we adapted trainings that were developed for community health workers, for nurses. We did asynchronous training where we did videotape lectures that they watched and answered questions. And then we did live training and we completely overwhelmed our audience of nurses. We threw way too much at them way too quickly. We learned a lot. So we adapted that for the second group. The way we studied two groups was we had 15 nurses in group one, wave one. And then we waited six months and then launched the second wave of nurses and we compared groups one and two in the first six months. So our model here is, again, the patient, the caregiver, always in the middle. Again, this is the, the schema from the original care ecosystem, but our nurse is the person they're paired with. And then there are a lot of other folks that they're tapped into because they're part of a larger system at MGB, the ICMP program. So they have a pharmacist, they have a social worker, and in many cases, they have a psychiatrist on the team as well. Our goal was to reduce emergency room visits and also improve symptoms of caregiver stress, behavioral symptoms of dementia, and look at healthcare utilization. This is the care ecosystem intervention. There's a standardized assessment for a caregiver and one for a patient with dementia. And these are the seven protocols um, looking at things like you know, caregiver well-being, behavioral intervention, safety screening, advanced care planning, and so forth. What's interesting is the nurses, when we talk to them qualitatively in rounds every week, they love this. They love the information. They love to have tools. And yet, they were completely overwhelmed with 180 patients on their caseload, only 10 or 15 of whom had dementia. They already had these patients on their caseload. But even trying to get them to utilize these new tools was overwhelming. And again, it was during COVID. And some of it was during the peak of one of the surges. And a lot of these nurses were dragged into other medical settings. So somehow, amazingly, we got this study done. Um, so just to, we're, we're going to run out of time in a minute, but these were some of our outcomes. Again, the utilization outcomes and the, and the clinical outcomes. And when we did a, a fidelity audit, essentially we looked at all of the records of the patients who were being followed by these nurses to see were they really implementing these protocols. And this was just a subset of the nurses. There were about 26 in the wave one and 28 in wave two with a mean age of their patients in the mid 80s. Again, demographically, ethnically, and racially not terribly diverse. But in terms of how frequent do they implement these seven protocols, these are just five of them here, or six of them here, about you know, 50% or so in the mid-40s or so, community resources, safety, med, med reconciliation, which they were really used to. But if you look at the right, only 11% actually utilized these behavioral management protocols that we taught them. So when you compare the two groups together, though, you see that they're more likely to address caregiver well-being provision of community resources and safety risks. And there were really no differences in care coordination. Not surprising, because that's their primary goal as a care manager. We learned so much from this um, intervention. And we're going to now utilize these learnings to try to do a randomized trial in four health systems across the US. You can't just train non-mental health providers and expect it to stick and expect them to intervene with what you're teaching them. I know it sounds obvious, right? But what's the way to make it stick? So we had these office hours where we would meet with them weekly and then biweekly for coaching, not unlike what Lexi does with her teams. Um, we had the problem of the large caseloads and many healthcare system priorities. There were so many priorities they were dealing with. They weren't focused only on one job during this time. Um, we redeployed people constantly, as you know, during the pandemic, and these nurses were a big part of that redeployment. Um, Nurses are not comfortable working with caregivers. They're just not. This has not come naturally to them. Social workers a bit more so based on their training. But nurses, they get good at it. But it's not something that comes as naturally. And some of them had had longstanding relationships with these patients and caregivers. And bringing up the idea of dementia, cognitive impairment, and some of the mental health challenges just felt uncomfortable to them. In some ways, they almost felt part of their families because they had pre-existing relationships. And that was a barrier we hadn't even thought about. But they took a lot of pride in this. They loved their increased knowledge base. And they were so interested in this that many of them stuck around for wave two and became peer support for the next wave of nurses. And one of them came with us to Washington, DC to a conference in April to give her, almost like you just did, Lexi, with a clinical vignette and her experiences um, within the program. So just finally, we're going to take the lessons learned from these two programs. And we're working on, and this is something that's really been a, a labor of love, but working with colleagues at the MGB level to create the first ever MGB Mind and Memory Care program. This is gonna take lessons learned from both models of care and try to really find a comprehensive dementia care program in primary care to meet the needs 
of what will be our own health plans Medicare Advantage plan that's gonna launch in January. It's gonna be comprehens comprehensive clinical model from diagnosis to death, essentially. Um, we're not only gonna try to improve clinical outcomes as we talked about, but also reduce the cost of care and try to make this a really meaningful and quality program. Um, there are so many pieces of this and maybe we can have another opportunity to talk further about interesting other aspects of this model. There are so many challenges working in a complex integrated healthcare system that I've learned over the last seven years. But engaging stakeholders is critical and change is wonderful until you're the one who's being asked to change. Especially if you're used to doing something and you think you're good at it. And by the way, you might think you're good at it, but you're not measuring how you're doing. And now someone's telling you how you're doing and nobody likes to hear that. Um, implementation challenges in our system are tricky because we have three major, more than three, but at least McLean MGH and the Brigham in psychiatry, academic healthcare systems. We have community hospitals, we have community practices. Some are owned and some are only affiliated. So what authority do you have over those practices to implement change? And do you have change agents on the ground who can really facilitate change? And um, you know, at the end of the day, I think our, our, the triple aim, and Lexi mentioned it really is the quadruple aim of healthcare, to improve the quality of care of the patient, the experience of the care of the patient, the population health, the reducing the cost. But very importantly, that fourth aim, which is the experience of the caregiver, or here, our clinicians. Our clinicians are burning out right and left in our system. And all over the country, we're seeing so many people leave medicine. Programs like this that we've been talking about this morning, I think reinvigorate our ex excitement about working with these patient populations. And, and I think you know, having someone like Lexi on our team here to sort of brainstorm about our work in different environments is helpful um, because this is a very different model than most of us were, were ever trained in. So uh, I gotta thank so many people who really helped us with these models at MGB. So, well, thank you all so much for being here and uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Friedberg. <laughs>